What is going on, everybody? And welcome back to the Greatest Combat Sports and Culture Show on the Italian Universe to Fight Podcast. I'm your host, Serge Vicente, and today we have a great episode for you. I always try to bring you best guests we possibly can. And like I've said before, this guy is a friend of the show, has been on before. I love having great minds. This is one of the best minds in all of MMA. He's a coach of multiple champions, the head coach of Extreme Couture. We have talking to none other, Coach Eric Nixon. Coach, what it do, man? Welcome to the show. What's up, Serge? Thanks for having me back, man. Oh, dude, absolute pleasure, man. Um, really happy to have you on. You, you've been busy, man. You, you. Yeah. I feel like every weekend I see you. Like, thank goodness UFC has a couple weeks off, so you can finally hopefully get some sleep. Yeah, man, it's nice. It's uh, you know, you get those like two weeks off or gaps, and the UFC doesn't have anything going on. So it's nice when uh, you're able to kind of hit the reset button and, and hang out and see the family and uh, you know, do sure. do the dad stuff. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you this before we even get into like all the fights and everything, man, personally for you, how, how have you been? Man? Is everything going well in the world of Eric Nixon? Yeah, it's been great, man. I've been having a lot of fun uh, actually coaching my kids flag football team. So that's uh, that's been keeping me keeping me occupied. But, you know, little man, little man loves the sport. So it's been good. Like just, just, just seeing him, just seeing him, you know, he's five. So it's like just yeah. seeing him understand that no matter what he wants to become, that hard work has to follow that. So like when we watching him play football and stuff, he just he, he understands it's like, all right, I want to be a good running back. I got to train. You know, I want to do this. I got to do this, you know. So I think just uh, just associating that, you know, he wants to do these these things and be good at it. He's got to right. work hard for it. Wait, he's five, you said? Oh, yeah, he's five. He's doing it, bro, too, yeah. bro. <laughs> you, 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 you're out here whipping him in his shape like he's yeah. thinking. Like, so hey, what, what's the difference between, you know, coaching you know your kids as opposed to coaching like the, all your pro athletes like how, what is the difference the biggest difference for you uh you know i think you have to shut it off um you have to be dad at times as right. well right like right. so i think i think when when it's on the football field with him like i talked because i played for my dad and i remember like you know you know my all the way up through high school my dad was our defensive coordinator so i think just being just being transparent i remember driving home with my dad once and i made a really great play at practice and technically left my you know i was playing strong safety and i read the i read the play correctly but i i technically left left my responsibility to go jump a route and i scored a pick six and i was like oh it's a great play and my dad's like no it wasn't you left your responsibility so he's like yelling at me at practice and i was just like man i don't understand like why this guy yells at me like this all the time and then we got in the car and he told me straight up he's like look man if i'm not the hardest one on you on the football field then everybody thinks you're going to be the one getting it getting easy and like i i'm the coach's kid that's why i get a play He's like, you're playing because you're good, and that's what I want everybody to understand. But you made the wrong decision, you know, because later on down the line, they're going to see you jumping that route. They're going to go up a seam route and, and expose right. that. So, Absolutely. you know, just I, I just have to try to remember the lessons my dad taught me when I was playing for him and try to apply those same ones to, to, to Knox. Well, look, I, it seems like he did a great job because obviously as a coach, you are out there. We, we've called you like one of the Yoda-level coaches, so you out there really <laughs> doing your thing. And, bro, it, like I said, it hasn't slowed down. Obviously, you know, you're always, I feel like, in the championship contender top five mix, regardless on organizations. And we'll talk about the other organizations in a little bit. But I got to talk about the biggest one coming up. And, I lo- I mean, I really want to get your thoughts on this. I mean, Al- Aljo and TJ is coming yeah. up. Yeah. And that – what has it been for you? Because, yeah, we had the trilogy, you know, with Jan – but more importantly, I feel like this is the first time we're getting a healthy Aljo win. How has it been getting a, a healthy and honestly a vindicated Aljo coming into camp as opposed to like the last few camps? He's been he's been awesome, and I think that's a great point on your on your part, Serge. Like, he you know obviously in the first Piotr Jan fight, he didn't disclose a lot of the injuries until after right. the fight, and then kind of the things he went through, and then it was public knowledge about the neck injury and everything else that he was kind of going through. So. Um, and I think that that he was able to kind of use that as fuel uh, um, going into the second fight. He's like, just wait, man. I'm telling you, this wasn't me. Like, I wasn't the full hundred percent of what I could have been. Um, and it wasn't it wasn't a way to make an excuse or anything like that. But the facts were the facts. And, it, and the guy who legit had you know surgery with the C7, I believe it was. You know, the yeah. disc replacement. So and that's um, something that some people don't r- come back from in that regard. And the fact that he was able to even like re- realistically compete with that is ridiculous. And I, I think that's the biggest thing too is like a lot of people don't realize um, how how debilitating it was every day to find out what we wanted to do for camp, right? Like, okay, hey, today, how do you feel? 
And it's like, ah, oh, I, I don't feel that great. Okay, we have to find something to make sure that we're getting our work in without irritating or hurting your neck or your or, or your shoulder any further. So it was a day by day routine. Like literally, he'd wake up in the morning, he would text me and go, "Man, I, I feel this today. Okay, we have to do this then." And or hey, we're the plan was to spar, but now, yeah. man, I, I really we can't really spar. So now we have to run situationals or drills instead. So it just it just always kind of uh, kind of touch and go. Whereas like this camp. Our, our weeks were planned out ahead, right? So yeah. it's like we knew everything that we were going to do. On, come, come Monday, it was the same routine. You know, I knew what practice he was going to be at. I knew what we are doing on the pads. I knew what wrestling practice he was going to be at. And, you know, he's got to get a lot of credit for this too, Serge. Is like mm -hmm. Aljo's kind of just runs his own camp. I help oversee it. And then Ray will, Ray will take over the helm when he gets back to Long Island and we'll stay in right. communication between all of us, you know, but – Really, Aljo is the CEO of his company, and I think that's what's important now. In a lot of ways, the fight game is, is shifting to, I believe. Like, fighters yeah, are sure. taking a little bit more of control of what they need. Um, and, again, like, we sat down and we kind of went over the things that he was in need of. And, again, it's like it's like if, you, if you're in for a job interview and they ask me, are you capable of doing this job? Do you want to take this job? And it was up to me if I wanted to work under, under those circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I did. I loved everything that we got to do as a, as a coach and a fighter. I have a hey, coach. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to cut you off. You, you're getting a little like on your, maybe your mic is rubbing on something. Maybe it'll, it'll go away in some stretch. Cause it was, it sounded so, so clear from the jump. And all of a sudden it, I started getting that little, like um, that feedback. It's right when, right when Felder walked in the room, bro. Take it's it his off. fault, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, no, no worries. I'm, I'm, we'll, we'll, like I said, we'll, we'll, like, I'll figure it out in post, brother. That's what I no do. We'll, we'll, make no it, we'll make it work. Um, but, yeah, I'm sorry. You were saying, I said, with, with Aljo just finishing that up, like he's a CEO of his own camp. He's really – and we are starting to see the shift in a lot of different athletes starting to do that. Yeah, and I think it's important, too, is because – you know, they, they, they're they kind of the, the keys to their own success in a lot of ways. And I think it's mm -hmm. important that they speak out um, when they need and what they need and what they're what they're seeing in their own camps, um, individuals as far as they're, they're, they're bringing in. And then having coaches that you can help bounce those ideas and feedback off of. But ultimately, these guys are the ones that are going in there and performing and executing their sure. fight. So um, I think that's – it's very interesting the way – Aljo's approaches it's something that I, I've learned a lot from and, and I think mm -hmm. I've benefited a lot from being able to work with Aljo at that capacity that's awesome that's so um are you are you heading out to Dubai as well no sir I'm saying no home. oh man you don't gotta deal with that <laughs> flight my guy that's what's up <laughs> no no we, we we talked early about that as well and hey do you, do you need me out there and he said I, I think I'm just gonna roll with Marab and um Dennis and I think Al and and, and uh Longo are heading out there as well so um, if, if he needed me, I would have made the trip. I wasn't mm -hmm. chomping at the bit to go, but um, I'm perfectly okay with what he's got, and that's what he did with his last fight. And uh, okay. you know, I, I completely understand my role in the situation with with Aljo, sure. and I'm, I'm I'm happy with and content. That's awesome, man. Well, look, I'm, that is a fight that I'm absolutely looking forward to because he he does look honestly in better shape than I've ever seen him, and it's kind of wild seeing a guy that we've always known to be in shape. He looks better, and it almost had again really vindicates the you know the I'm sure the the year and a half of, of shit talk that all of you guys really took you know oh, being no. able to get that win. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was telling him, bro. It's funny how like now we don't get any clown faces on our on our post and story. You know, everybody, all the Russians jumping your shit. You know, it was it was rough, man. But you know, we all stuck through it. <laughs> That's man, it's great. And it was cool even seeing the moment that, that uh, Aljo shared on his IG, them shaking hands, like yo, we maybe we'll do it again sometime. It was really cool to kind of see the 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 respect among warriors. You know what I'm For saying? Sure. It was cool you know, and I, I, honestly, I don't think it was a lot that had to do with Piotr Jan. I think it's a lot to do with the fan base more than anything. You know, I, I've trained For with sure. Piotr. I've held pads for the guy. We're still friends to this day. We talk. Yeah. And again, this is a business, and this, and this is a sport. And uh, I like to keep it that way, man. Like uh, we're competitors, and I compete against sure. my friends. It happens, but at the end of the day, man, it's it's these these guys go in and get the respect that they that they do when they go in the cage. Mm -hmm. And once it's over, man, let, let that shit go. That's what's and see. I, uh, I I feel like I'm I'm from that school of thought. Also, like growing up within martial arts and stuff, you're like, look, I can. Have, but when it's done, it's done. Like yeah. it's weird seeing dudes out here, you know punching dudes and steakhouses and all kind of other nonsense that's going on, <laughs> you, yeah. know, you know? 
So, um, all right, let me ask you about somebody else. Um, again, you you have a a team full of killers and somebody who a fight that just got announced. We have you know Magomed Akalayev, you know, against Jan Blachowicz. That's going to be UFC 282 uh, this December. Yo, that that's a big fight with huge title implications. Um, is Ankalaev the next dominant 205 pound champion in the UFC? I, I think he can be, and from from what I've seen in the room and what he's capable of doing, I, I definitely think he can be. From the feet to the floor, he's he's very well rounded, and yeah. uh, you know I think I think that the, the the kind of the knock on him as of late is is he is he boring? Is he winning the fights that you kind of the way you want to see him win? But you got to remember, like you're trying to navigate your way through the rankings, not, right. not only not only to win the fight, but to get two paychecks, right? And keep, and keep sure. moving, keep moving your way up that rankings to where once you get into that position where you're fighting for possibly the number one contender, then you can mm-hmm. let your hair down and go after a little bit. But the guy that I see in the room every day when he comes out and does his camps, the dude is sure. a straight assassin, and everybody in the room will tell you, like Sean Strickland will tell you, like Ankalaev is the boogeyman in here. Yo, I, I, it drives me crazy hearing people talk about fighters being boring that are winning. It, it, it's it's a crazy concept to me. And it's like, and speaking again to Sean Strickland and all these guys, like, I mean, Adesanya right now is is getting shit on left and right. Like him and Agalai are guys that are so dominant that I feel like once you're dominated after a specific amount of time, people like... I don't know. It, maybe it's just me, but it seems like people don't appreciate what they have in front of them. They're not appreciating yeah. greatness. Well, they're like, grabbing the what bag, What am I missing? Too. What was that? I mean, they're grabbing the bag because, remember, you're getting pay-per-view buys when you're when you're the champ. So yeah. I don't I don't care how you win that fight, man. That you're fighting for that money. Like, like right. literally, if you get to that pay-per-view, uh, man, like, just win. Hold on and win. Yeah. And, and, and you got to think from my perspective, too, Serge, is like, I don't care how you win the fight. Mm-hmm. And if the way a fight plays out in round one, if I see a path to victory, if our game plan was for Paul Felder to go in and strike with this guy, but Paul goes in and out wrestles this dude in the first round, or we score a takedown sure. or two, and I see a hole in this guy's get up game, well, guess what? The game's going to shift and it's going to go to sure. something where I see the path of least resistance. So mm-hmm. if you see that in a fight for, for Ankalaev or any of these guys that are finding a clear path to victory and a way to win, and it's not the most exciting, don't be mad at them. They're just trying to do what the right job is, and that's to win the fight. I mean, yeah, and at the end of the day, I agree with you. It's like, if you can't stop it, man, tough noogies. That's like, right, bro. That's on you. That's right, bro. If, if I got if I ran a trap up the middle and I was getting 15 yards a clip, guess what I'm going to be keep running? <laughs> running the ball. You right ran that joint down the middle. Trapping you right down the middle, bro. <laughs> Facts. All right, well, let me – so. Um, transitioning just a little bit, because again, you, you are having a lot of these guys at the top of the card at this present moment in time. And like I said, not just in the UFC, Bellator, PFL, shit, one championship we have guys. Um, you've been able to take veteran fighters. So guys who have had success with other coaches and you've been able to give them, I, I throw in air quotes, a fresh coat of paint. It seems like how for you, like. Have you been able to help them get over the hump? The the Aljos, the the Cody's, I mean, the other guys like that. Like, what is it for you that you've been able to deal with these veterans in that way and kind of help them again have that fresh coat of paint? Yeah, I think you just you're just trying to add more tools to the tool shed, to be honest with you, and mm-hmm. and uh, trying to keep them who they are. But like like that's a great point. Is just really just trying to find their the areas that maybe they weren't, they weren't working on fully or there are some of the things that may, they might've been deficient in, but mm-hmm. giving them different ideas and situations that maybe they think that they were, they were, they weren't good or they were deficient in and try to flip mm-hmm. it to where maybe it's something that they know that they're, that they're not only good there, but they can actually excel there. You right. know, like for Francis, right. for example, that like we had that heart to heart and we sat down and we just try to figure out like, look, what are the things that you're afraid of? And what are the things that don't you like to do? And yeah, once, yeah. as a coach, you you identify those things, then it gives us something to work on. And then when you explain it to them, to that capacity of why you're doing things, so they understand where the, the destination is going, right? It's like, mm-hmm. I don't want to throw you on the boat and you just keep going like, bro, where are we going? It's like, here, right. if we're doing these things, it's going to help shore these things up. In lieu of that, guess what, bro? If we ever needed to wrestle in a championship fight and you have a blown out knee, you're going to be able to fucking wrestle and fall back on it. So right, let's make right. sure we shore up all those things. I know you can knock anybody out in the world, 
But what happens if you can't get to them because you have a bad knee, right? So running those hypotheticals and scenarios and try to try to try to brush up or, or strengthen some of those things that you might have considered a weakness. But mm -hmm. I think that's something that for for me is just really sitting down and listening to that fighter that comes over from another gym. And yeah. it's not like, hey, like Cody Garbrandt's fucking really good. And Alpha Mel yeah, made absolutely. that dude really good. And there's yeah. there's no there's no reason why he could he could stay there and still be a world champion. But because of circumstances, he moved over here, and then you, you have to listen to what, what they're here for and then try to be the best coach you can to, to apply those abilities for them. Uh, that, that's awesome. That's, that's it's great insight also because it, it's amazing. And again, in, in super camps and super teams, the way people put it, I mean, there are so many different egos uh, yeah. that, that, that come with it. And I know a, a coach's job is not only obviously coach the X's and O's, but it's also to manage those personalities. And it seems like there is a, a, a willingness or a, a lack of ego in your team hearing, you know, other athletes talk about, for instance, Sean Strickland and, and what he brings to the table, hearing like yourself even talk about what Aljo and some of those other guys bring to the table. It's, it's a really cool thing to, to, to see and seeing it from one of the, honestly, the, the, the oldest established teams in combat sports is really dope to see. So, I mean, just kudos to you on that. And no, I appreciate the culture that. you guys have established. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it takes a village, man. We have we have a team of coaches here that are super accomplished, man. And and, and yeah. Eddie Brocco's running a great program. And Eddie's head coach to numerous fighters in here. Dennis Davis, myself, yeah. Ray Seffo. You know, you got uh, Nate Pettit. You got yeah. uh, Jimmy Gifford, Jake Shields. So mm -hmm. I think that's what makes us successful is it starts with us as the coaches and we set that precedence for the rest of the team. But mm -hmm. ideally is like, look, man, we can't coach everybody, right? Right. Not, not to mention, if you're able to share some of those responsibilities with these guys who are very smart at their craft and what they do, then mm -hmm. everybody in the gym feels like they're doing something. They're doing part of the work or they feel just as accomplished. So mm -hmm. when we won gym of the year last year, man, that was such a so, it's such a great moment for the entire team because I see the blood, sweat, and tears that go on for in the sure. every day, bro. Every day. Yeah. So, man, I appreciate you saying that. Oh, no, dude, it's it's dope to see. And again, somebody who's been around the game as long as like, I mean, paying attention since the early 2000s, you know what I mean? And 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 being able to like be around the sport, seeing consistency and you see those things and you see teams come and go. You really do. So to be able to see consistency and in, in people consistently going there and speaking so highly of it. I mean, I have to talk about it, man. Um, All right. Uh, Before we get you out of here, a couple quick hitters, because it, there are there's so much going on in combat sports now. And granted. You're usually coaching on every single one of these cards, but PFL, UFC, one championship Bellator. There's so much going on right now. Talk really quick about the, the state of, of not just combat sports and MMA and just how fun it's been for you as a fan of the sport. No, I'll tell you when, like today I had a kid come in. Um, I trained with him when I was out in Austin and he actually came out to Vegas to visit. He's 14 years old. Yeah, and he started he started he started his martial arts journey when he was four and i think you're starting to see that more and more um you know we started to see it probably in the late late 2000s right like mm -hmm. kids weren't playing multiple sports they were in here wrestling or they were One. doing jujitsu yeah. and i think that this is this is kind of the evolution of what we're seeing in the sport is is these kids is this is a, a day in day out it's jujitsu wrestle kickbox mma whatever the hell that they're doing and you're starting mm -hmm. to see that now in the new generation of fighters. Like we we saw Raul go out in the contender series. I mean, we've seen Raul in our gym for the last three years, and he's 17 years yeah. old now with a with a with a UFC contract. So this is where the Nuts. sport's going, Serge. Man, it's it's crazy to see. And and if and, you know, not saying you can't start later on in your life because you can, but right now these kids are in there are killers, bro. <laughs> oh, dude, you see, I mean, yeah, that that kid is 17. I was just at um. Uh, team body shop and, and i was rolling around with some of those dudes uh not to know that's over there in long beach um uh the mckee's gym over there oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah so i'm over there with those guys man they and again i haven't trained in a while so i'm like let me just move around they put me in there with the, one of those 17 year old kids i was like holy shit oh, yeah. <laughs> yo you are just fighting them off and they don't stop coming they just yeah. keep going at you they're like rabid dogs bro there is nuts <laughs> See, I remember AJ, AJ was at, when Ray Seffo's last fight for actually World Series of Fighting, Antonio was on that card, and Antonio yeah. and Ray were in the same locker room together, and AJ was probably 14 years old, maybe younger. Was, was that the one in New York? 
No, it was in um, it was in L.A. like in like okay. Ontario or something like that. Okay, okay. And and uh, and I remember I remember looking at AJ McKee like fourteen maybe at the time thirteen, and he was in there rolling up grown ass men, dude, in that workout room. I'll never forget that. I looked over at Antonio. I was like, this kid is gonna be a problem. And, and, and that he is, and that yes, he sir. is. That man, it's crazy to watch. Um, what if all the other like have you do you ever watch any of the kickboxing that one has? I try. I definitely, I, I definitely try. I don't. I don't get to catch it enough, but I try. I try to watch that for sure. Do you like what they're bringing to the American combat sports diaspora? Because if you look at, it, I feel like they're the one organization that's kind of doing it different than the UFC. Yeah, not only that. I mean, they're they're adding the jujitsu element in. They're having the MMA side of things. I think they're just uh, trying to add a bigger platform for more people to understand. You know that they're that you just it doesn't have to be straight MMA, but there's so many other facets to this sport that are just as exciting to watch. Not yeah. only that, I mean, there's guys in that in that uh, division, especially for one, that are super uber talented. Man, you go there and watch some of those pure kickboxing matches, and you can pick up some good stuff. Bro, the, that Muay Thai with the little gloves is it, oh, yeah, what gets nasty. me. Oh, nasty. bro, like yeah, it's. It, yep. It's 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 like, and then you're starting to see some of those dudes like transition over. Ah, oh, I, I I love every bit of it. I mean, you got yep. uh, what's it? It's nuts. It's, it's so dope. Uh, all right, um, before we get you out of here, two two of them really quick. We have to talk about it. One fifty five, Charlie Olives Islam. I yeah. have to get your thoughts on this matchup because a lot of people. It's interesting. You still hear the. Charles is a quitter on one side, but he's also been one of the most entertaining fighters over the last two and a half years. Uh, and then you have the protege of Khabib. If Charles wins this fight, is there a legitimate argument that he is the greatest lightweight of all time? I mean, you can make that argument. I definitely think that you can make that argument. Here's the thing. I that, mean, that, it could be Paul Felder also. He is the last dude to beat. <laughs> I mean, hey. <laughs> you, uh, you, you, you can. Here's, here's the thing. Let's, let's the, the quitting thing. Okay, yes, he might have quit early on in his career, but maybe he needed that moment mm -hmm. to change a mindset or give him the spark that he needed to get to the point where he's at today. I think yeah. if you are so critical about somebody's past that mm -hmm. you're not giving them the benefit of the doubt of what they're doing right now for the future, you're you're giving it's a complete discredit to the to the kid and what he's been done what, what he's been doing. You know, yes, mm -hmm. I think we've all found something that we've quit we've quit on yeah, yeah. all of us have, you know, yeah. and, and, and look, you put a dude like Paul Felder on top of you, elbowing your brains in 99% of the population is going to find a way out. They're going to quit, Thanks. but yeah. it's not that it's how you respond to it and how he's responded to those moments where he's quit. He's now one of the most dangerous men in the world, not at 155, at any division in the fucking world. So you got to give credit where credit's due, and I'm kind of I'm kind of sad, and, and it's kind of sickening to hear people still lay on that quitter thing with this with this poor guy because the dude's a bad motherfucker, and he should get the credit, you know. Oh, and then you know when it comes to Islam, you got to remember matchup wise, Islam is a guy who has anti wrestling jujitsu, and mm -hmm. what do I mean by that? Mm -hmm. He's going to play probably more of a half guard positions, turk the yep. leg, sit in the pins, try to go backside wrist rides, things like that, cross grips. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for guys to play jujitsu off of their back, right? Um, and, and then that's when the ground and pound starts coming in. So he has a style that can kind of stymie Islam, but I also yeah. don't know if that's the route you want to go either. I don't know if that's the route you want to go and play is that, sure. hey, for five rounds, you want to get Oliveira on his back and play somewhat in his guard because he's a guy who's not very easy to hold down as well. Now you got to think is when they talk about those positions, there's a transitional position there. So mm -hmm. getting him to the ground and getting him back up to the ground, there's areas of transition that we, I can, I can tell you sure. that Oliveira is probably one of the best, if not the best in the mm -hmm. world at mm -hmm. finding transitional submissions. So yeah. you get up off of a takedown and you leave your head hanging just a half inch. Guess who's on your neck? Charles yeah. Oliveira. Guess who's on your back? Charles Oliveira. So you got to be very, very careful in that regard, man. Mm -hmm. I think this fight, I'll be, I'm almost, I can, I can tell you, man, I wouldn't be surprised if Charles Oliveira takes Islam down. I wouldn't be surprised if he tries yeah. to take him down and put him on his back. I've seen these Dagestanians in my gym. They're yeah. they're the nastiest dudes on top. 
Mm-hmm. They have a sure as shit is a hard time on their back. Interesting. Not, not very fun on their back. So, and you were talking about how with Charles, too, he, not only his transition game, I mean, his sweeps are ridiculous. So his, even if he keeps all of that, yeah. 100%. So I'm, it, that would be interesting to see him, you know, because he does have a tendency like he might maybe like pull guard and actually seeing him if he pull guard and try to like sweep from that. Like, I, I don't know. It's just seeing what he can do. He just had, I feel like he has so many options, which well, is Well, he's the one guy that can, he almost has a built in standing eight count. Right. He just right. to fall to his butt and, and guys are like, here, jump in my guard. But will Islam be a guy that says, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll play that game with you and get into his guard. I think he's, I think Islam would be, safe there because of the style that he does play he does play mm-hmm. that dagestani wrist ride handcuffs right, right. knee rides or uh, uh killing the knee things of that mm-hmm. sort and i think that's important versus a guy like Oliveira. but i don't know how long you want to play there for surge because that dude will find a submission at any point during the fight you could be 4-0 going in around five with 30 seconds left and you slip up and now you're caught in a dart show yeah, and and as, as as of recently, I mean, it seems like he needs to get touched up a little bit to get started, and, yeah, no uh, and he, you know what I'm saying. So if he continues that, I'm I'm again a fight that I'm really looking forward to. Last one before we get you out of here, um, and it, dude, thank you so much for your time. Like yeah, I know pleasure, how busy bro. you are, man. So I really do appreciate it. Uh, we talked about him a little earlier, Adesanya, a guy that you've coached against in Alex Pejera. I mean, again, people are 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 using the the kickboxing fight from years ago as oh, that's the end all be all. What when you see this matchup, what goes through your mind? Well, I think you could take some things away, technical things away from that fight. But um, again, like I don't really play the MMA math. I've, I've cornered against both of those guys. When yeah. I, you know when Brad fought Izzy, it, it became the faint game, and the way that Izzy sets up his feints and draws things mm-hmm. out. I don't think there's really a lot of guys better than him in the game, to be honest with you. And then you have a guy in Perea where, you know, he's he's a daunting figure in front of you, but he's oh, yeah. very, 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 very technical with everything that he does and that he throws. Um, and that was the thing we were worried about the most with Sean Strickland was the short, was the left hook. And, you know, the thing with that left hook is it's, it's so tight, so compact, but it's yeah. able to find its target. So when you look at the knockouts that he had against Izzy, and you talk about kickboxing where you have on 12-ounce mm-hmm. or 8-ounce gloves, that that size of that glove gives you a false sense of security when you have yeah. your hand here because you have this much surface area to cover. Now you have MMA gloves on, which are fours. You don't have right. that same coverage when it comes to defense. So mm-hmm. Izzy's got to make sure that when he's throwing anything in that pocket that his defense is the most concern of his and not the offense because what's, com- what's coming back at him is, is to harm him. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah, for it's sure. It's not going to be good. It's not going to be good. So I think I think it'd be smart for for Izzy to stay on his lateral movement in his faint game and try to get Alex into deeper waters and try to test that cardio. Um, you know that was the game plan with Sean Strickland was to go in and right, go in mm-hmm. right away and wrestle. But when you have an idiot like Sean Strickland as your fucking guy, <laughs> he doesn't listen all the time. To- listen all the time. It changes the game plan halfway fucking through. So, <laughs> hey man, it keeps you guys on your toes, man. Oh, I you God. know it has to make going to work interesting. Oh my God. <laughs> well, look, hey, Coach, man, Coach, I, I really appreciate your time, brother. Um, much continued success. Uh, again, you, you keep doing your thing. I hope to have you back on the show again soon. Coach, thank you again for your time, brother. My pleasure, sir. It's good to talk to you, my man. Absolutely, man. You take care. Everybody, All right. Coach Eric Nixie. All right, take care. Later, brother. Later. All right, everybody, that was our combo with Coach Eric Nixick. Man, I tell you, he is fantastic at what he does. I mean, he is, like I said in the in the conversation, the, the Yoda-level type of coach. He, he's in there with multiple champions. You got Francis Ngannou in the room. You have Al Jermaine Sterling. But not only do you have that, I mean, you have Ever. So you have so many guys that they end up working with over there. So um, salute to him. Salute to everybody at Extreme Couture. Uh, this has been Episode 357 of the Fight Podcast. I'm your host, Serge Vicente. Thank you guys so much for checking us out. Make sure you like, share, subscribe. Not only this video, check out the rest of the videos that we have at the Fight Podcast. Um, listen to the Fight Podcast everywhere. Podcasting is available. Apple, Google Play, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, um, thefightpodcast.com. Also check us out. If we have merch, go ahead and grab a merch. You see me rocking the shirt right now. Etsy.com slash shop slash the Fight Pod Shop. Thank you guys. That was our combo with Eric Nixick. Love y'all. Peace.